All right, welcome everybody, welcome all our Torah Anytime viewers. Uh, tonight we are learning Le'ilu Nishmat Miriam Bat Bracha. We're going to be continuing the, our, our second class of the series of the story, the amazing story actually, of Rabbi Akiva and the amazing lessons that we can learn from his, from his story. So, Again, I would recommend for anybody who hasn't heard the first part, this is a, a series that it sort of continues more or less, so I would recommend to catch up. But in all said and done, you will be able to learn tremendously, even if you haven't heard any, any of the first part, you will be able to learn uh, from the second part as well. Okay, so just as a, a recap, we started off our, um, last, last week's class that Rabbi Akiva, he started off as an ignorant, uh, poor shepherd, didn't have anything, ended up marrying one of the wealthiest daughters of the generation, uh, the wealthiest man's daughter of the generation. The wealthy man, Kalba Sabuah, did not was not happy with the marriage. He disowned uh, the Rachel, his daughter, uh, because she married Rabbi Akiva, who was an ignoramus, who didn't know how it uh, li- was illiterate. He couldn't even read the, the alphabet. So he disowned her, and she went on to live uh, in poverty with Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva went, and he studied, and studied, and studied, and studied, and studied, and until he, he tore everything apart, until he was able to, to dissect the entire Torah and really, really delve into the depths of it. And he became one of the, the greatest giants that we know, um, you know to this day. There, you know, one of the stories when the, we didn't mention was that uh, as, as he was contemplating uh, to go and learn or go not to learn, to listen to what, you know, before he actually married Rachel, he, uh, he saw this, the, the famous story, he saw water dripping onto a rock. And the water was slowly dripping, 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 dripping. And he noticed that the rock was slowly, there was, there was a crevice, there was a little hole in the rock, a cavity from the dripping of the water. And he was thinking, he's like, how is it possible? Water is something that's, pl- that that's mendable to whatever is in, in the container, whatever, it, it's, it doesn't have a form. It's, you know, it doesn't hurt if you, if you throw uh, you know, water at somebody. But yet this water was able to go and take apart the, one of the hardest substances, which is a rock. So he, he thought, he says, listen, if this water, which is with continuous drips, is able to go and take apart this entire rock and make a hole into it, so too the Torah, which is also compared to water, can make a hole, uh, a hole and, and penetrate into my, into my rock as well. And he followed also in the, same, in the same matter. How did the water go? It kept on dripping, nonstop, dripping, dripping. So he too, he persevered. He kept on going and going and going. When things were difficult, when things were tough, he kept on going on, onto it. The... Um, the, the life that his wife had to go through and had to give up was, was, a, was a very difficult one. She lived in, in, in dire poverty. And one of the things that really bothered Rabbi Akiva is that his wife, who was once such a wealthy woman, gave up so much for him. And what could he do back in return? He's not even able to give her anything. And one day, she, you know, he, she woke up and he saw her pulling straw out of her hair. And he felt so bad. He's like, he's like you know, this wealthy woman, look what she did for me. And he promised at that point in time, um, uh, I don't know if promise is a strong word, but he said, he said, if, I, if God would ever give me money, I'm going to make for you, my Eshet Chayel, I will make for you a Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, a, 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 a um, tiara, 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 whatever, I'm not a girl, I don't know, one of those crowns, that is a, um, a, a, a picture of the, what's actually a carving of the, the city of Yerushalayim, which is the, the old city of Yerushalayim today. So, when, uh, when, when he made up with his father-in-law, and which actually when his father-in-law made up with him, and he went and, dis- and basically you know, removed the vow, he gave him right away half his wealth. So Rabbi Akiva instantly became a very, very wealthy man. And the first thing that he did was he went and he, and he, uh, and he made for his wife a Yerushalayim Shazahab, a city of gold, and he was able to uh, put her as, as a crown. Now, um, Ra- Rachel, his wife, actually had to go through a lot in order just to survive. And it is said that she even had to go and sell her hair. To, in order to just survive and put some food on the table, she had to go cut her hair and she had to sell it. So, um, during this time, Rabbi Akiva became extremely, extremely popular. And, you know, the Chachamim, everybody knew his standing, his, his tremendous uh, um, righteousness and, and the wisdom that he had in the Torah, that it, the, it literally spread to the four corners of the world. So much so that if somebody was, uh, let's say, traveling, and during, during back in the day over there, uh, well, actually everywhere, was very dangerous to travel. There was always higher robbers in the ships, and you had pirates, and you have a very, very difficult situation to move from one place to another, unless you're in a large caravan and you have a, um, a, you know, a strong amount of, of people. So... There was, uh, you know, there was a story that once, you know, robbers came and there were students of Rabbi Akiva, and they, they robbed them for the students. And when they found that, when the robbers found out, these thieves found out that these were students of the Rabbi Akiva, the famous Rabbi Akiva, they gave them back their money. Can you imagine? You know, like they gave them, they were able to get scot free. They gave them back and said, "No, we're going to go and escort you to make sure no one else is going to go and harm you." This is what they did to the students of Rabbi Akiva. Imagine the, imagine the level that, uh, and, and literally, the, the amount of, of publicity that he had throughout the entire world. He was a st- the, one of the highest standing rabbis at that time. 
So during this time, he was learning in yeshiva in Yavne, and the head of the, the, the charity of Israel, the, the person, uh, Rabbi Yeshua, passed away. It's not Rabbi Yeshua that was his teacher, but it was a different Rabbi Yeshua. And he passed away, so they wanted to go and give this position to now Rabbi Akiva, which means that he will be charged in all the charities that everything that has to be distributed in Israel is going to go through Rabbi Akiva. So Rabbi Akiva said, listen, my wife gave up so much so I could learn Torah. This is going to take away a little from learning Torah. I have to ask my wife for permission. So... Uh, he goes, he asks his wife, Achal, he says, you know, do you mind if I do this? She says, absolutely, if it's for Qadr Yisrael, it's for the Jewish nation. By all means, I support it 100%. So he goes and he accepts, he accepts the, the position. And he goes and, and he has to also fundraise. Fundraising is not a fun thing to do. Um, it's never, you know, it's very, you know, you know ask other people for money. It, it's, it's a very hard, a hard and difficult thing to do. That's why also, just a little tidbit, if you know anybody that needs money, don't wait for them to come to you. Rather, go and give them money so that they don't have to have that feeling to do that. Or organization that's suffering, that Needs, the, the needs funds, don't wait for them to go and make a whole fundraising campaign, but rather you go, the schah has also been created, you're going on your own for, you know, for fruition and you're giving the money that uh, you want to give for Tzedakah. But in any case, so he went, he had a, um, a friend, a, a big rabbi, Rabbi Tafon, who was very wealthy, and he needed to raise money. So he went over to this rabbi, and he goes over to Rabbi Tafon, and he says, listen, he says, I have a wonderful opportunity that came up that you can make a lot of money. So Rabbi Tafon and said, oh, that's awesome. He says, he gave him 4,000 gold coins. So Rabbi Akiva went, um, and he didn't say, I'll make you a lot of money, I'll give you a, a great fruits on your investment, which means you'll be able to, to, to gain a lot from this. So he gives him 4,000 gold coins. After a while, he goes back to Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Tafan, the one who donated, and he says, so, you know, how's my investment doing? He's like, oh, it's phenomenal. He says, come, let me show you. And he thinks he's going to take him to a field where he bought, you know, a nice piece of real estate, a piece of land, and he takes him to the Beth Midrash. He takes him to the, to the synagogue, and he sees all these people learning all for you because of your money. So Rabbi Tafan went, and he kissed him, and he says, oh, he said, by the way, you can't usually do that to most people now because you'll be in jail for fraud. But uh, this, this rabbi, he, re, he knew the rabbi Talfon. He knew the, the level that he do. And he says, oh, he says, you're right. I did gain a lot from this. And he went and he gave him even more charity. So the, um, the devotion that Rabbi Akiva had was not only the Torah, but it was also to the Jewish people as well. Now, during this time, there was a, um, a, one time the Rabbi Akiva walks in and there's a meeting. He was called in for a meeting with all the big rabbis. And he sees over there somebody who looks really familiar, clearly not Jewish. And he sits down, and the guy introduced himself as he's from the from the Roman uh, from the Roman uh, government, the high government official. Uh, Rabbi Kiva recognized him because he, Rabbi Kiva was one person that he, he went through uh, travels a lot and he traveled from place to place and in fact one of the main things I want to focus today is Rabbi Kiva's travels and so he went and, and he says he says listen gentlemen he said I was sent here by Flavius Clemens if you guys don't remember Flavius Clemens who was one we spoke about in the first class he was, um, he was somebody who, who in fact saved Rabbi Kiva when, when Nachum Yishkamzu went over there with the, with the dirt and he was very close to the emperor he was actually a close family relative of the emperor, and he had a strong liking to Rabbi Akiva, and he had a strong liking to Judaism as well. Um, I guess if you, if you want to know the lineage of what was going on, I guess it's good to know. So you had, uh, people remember Vespasian. He was the one who put the siege around Yerushalayim. Then he had a son, Titus. Titus was the one who destroyed the second Beth Amikdash. Titus had a brother, Domitian, which is the current emperor at this point in time. He was the one that became emperor after Titus died. Remember, he had that fly in his head, and he uh, you know, ate it apart, so he had that. Now, Vespasian had a, had a brother, and that brother had a son, which was Flavius Clemens. So you see, this Flavius is also in that. And who did Flavius Clemens marry? He married, um, you know, Vis Vespasian had a, had a daughter. And that daughter had another daughter, Domitella, which was where then went and married, um, um, he married uh, Tite, uh, Flavius Clemens. Okay, so, so it's a pretty close-knit uh, circle going on here. But we see over here that Flavius Clemens was very close to the, to the, Roman, um, to the Roman government. And in fact, we'll soon see that he was uh, potential to be next in line to be emperor. So um, he, this, this, uh, this Roman government official says that it was, I was sent here from Flavius Clemens to tell you about the situation that's going on in Rome. He says it's not a good situation at all. He says that, you know, Domitian, this guy is crazy. This guy is off this rocker. He says, uh, you know, like uh, he, he makes gods. He was, he's very into the, the ancient gods of Rome. And he, he puts himself as a god himself. And he also put, you know, his father, Vespasian, a god, his brother, Titus, a god. And he forces everybody to worship these gods. But at the same point in time, he also makes fun of these gods. It says, this guy's a flip-flopper. Even when they tell us that even another crazy story, it says he, he found a liking to a certain woman. So he had her husband murdered, so she'll become available. And then he'll be able to marry her. But he had her husband murdered, but he never ended up deciding to want to marry. He sort of left her. He says, well, you know, what is this guy doing? And then he made up some crazy rule. of emperor is not allowed to marry this, you know, whatever, a whole, a whole uh, thing. And he says that the problem now issues is that this, besides... Um, his, his craziness, he also had a hatred for anybody, um, a personal vendetta against anybody that didn't believe in his gods. So he had the philosophers, were atheists or whatever they were, they didn't really believe in all the gods. He had a very, and he pushed them out. 
And now the, the issue that he was coming to the Jewish nation was, first of all, we know the Jewish nation don't follow the gods of the Romans. And to make matters worse, the, a lot of Roman officials were actually learning about Judaism and were like, hey, this makes a lot more sense than you know, bowing down to Jupiter, which is just a planet. You know, things just made more sense. And many Roman, not just regular Roman officials, the high elite Roman officials, um, the noblemen and the noble woman, they went and they started converting to Judaism. So he saw this as a threat. Not, a, not only a threat because they converted, but also the Jewish nation was a threat to them. So the, he was, so, so the warning that this Roman government was, was giving, this official was giving, he says that the, there's a potential that he is going to put out a decree all Jews, said not all Jews, but like in, you know, Haman al which didn't happen yet, this is already, be, uh, which I'm sorry, which happened already before. So, the, um, so, so they, the messenger said, he says, the reason why I'm coming here is I came on behalf of Flavius Clemens. He said that you should, A, start fasting to pray to your God, and B, he wants you guys to come in, the, you know, a few uh, um, of the select of the Chachamim, the sages, he wants you to come in to discuss the matter in person and discuss with his friends also to see what, if anything, could possibly be done. So they decided that they're going to go. Rabbi Akiva was going to be part of that, uh, of that journey. It was going to be Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Elizabeth ben Azariah, Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Akiva all, all went to this on this journey. On the way, they stopped by the, the Holy Temple, the Holy Temple to pray, but it wasn't a temple anymore because it was destroyed, so now it was just the, you know, Kotel Amaravi, the western wall was the only one that's standing. So they go in there, and, and you'll see how Rabbi Akiva, no matter what the situation is, he always sees the good in things. They, they go and they see the temple. Well, they see the temple in ruins. Now we go into the temple, you know, you, you go into the temple area, you're supposed to, you know, rice kriya, you're supposed to rip a little bit because you're mourning it because the temple was destroyed and people cry because the temple was destroyed. Imagine how hard it was for people that lived through the temple. They saw the temple when it was, when it was you know, high in its standing. And then they saw the destruction and they're coming back to see just a bunch of, you know, rubbish and, and garbage everywhere and piles and, and animals going in and out of it. So the Chachamim saw it and they started crying. But yet, when, when did they start crying? When they saw a fox coming out of the Kodesh HaKadoshim. The holiest of holiest. When, the, when the, only the Kohen Gadol is allowed to enter inside there, they saw a fox just, you know, roaming in and out. So all the Chachamim, they started crying. Rabbi Akiva was smiling. So they look at, you know, they're crying. They're looking at Rabbi Akiva and they say, Rabbi Akiva, why are you smiling? So he replies to them back. He says, you know, my dear sages, why are you crying? He says, what do you mean, how are we crying? He says, we see a place where, where, the, where only the Kohen Gadol was able to go in and now we have a fox just rolling in and out of it. We shouldn't cry. And Rabbi Kiva answered, that's exactly why I am laughing and why I'm smiling. He says, he says there's, a, there's a pasuk in Yishayahu that, that uh, puts two different prophecies together. One from Uriah, one from Zechariah. And there are two not in the same time. One was from the first temple, one was from the second temple. And he said, why are these two together? It doesn't make any sense. There are two separate time frames. Rather, the reason why the pasuk is putting them together is because there must be a link, a connection between these two um, between these two, excuse me, prophecies. It must be that they're, they're, they come in hand in hand. Now, what is one prophecy? which was the Brad prophecy, was a prophecy where it said that, that the temple man will be like a forest. And we see that, you know, came true. Like a forest is just walking, you know, a, a fox is walking in and out without any problems. But at the same point in time, the other prophecy says that the, the you know, the Yerushalayim will be rebuilt and you'll have people that are walking with canes, which means they're old people walking in the city and children will be playing in the streets. It means it's going to be rebuilt at one point. Now, why are they connected? It must be that they, they have something together. So it's just like now, I see that one part of the prophecy comes true. So now I'm ha happy because I know that there's a second part of the prophecy is going to come true as well. And they said, Akiva Nechamtanu, you, you consult us, Akiva. That's what they told um, the, the rabbis. Told them. And he, and now they felt confident with the trip. They continued on the way to Rome. When they get to Rome, you see there was a, they made crazy, uh, um, yeah, I don't want to say banquets, parades, like big things for an honor of the gods, an honor of the army, whatever, in different occasions they make parades, they made, they made different parties. The, this particular, when they entered the, into Rome, there was a huge parade going on, so much so that they saw it from the distance. And there were people playing music and dancing and the, you know, things are you know, parading down, all the whatever they did, I don't know, they didn't have healing balloons, but they did like crazy stuff. And uh, so, so the Chachamim saw this, they started crying again. Rabbi Akiva saw this, he started smiling again. So they look at him again, they say, Rabbi Akiva, why are you smiling? So he goes over to them again, he says, well, you, know, you know, my dear, my dear colleagues, why are you guys uh, crying? He says, well, not to cry, he says that Yerushalayim is destroyed. Jerusalem is, you know, the, forget about Jerusalem, the entire Israel is under the Roman rule. And now we look, we look at these Shaim, the people that are going and they're serving Abu Azara. They're actually doing this parade for Abu Azara. They're, they're constantly doing, they're sinning against God. And look how they're getting rewarded. They're living a life of peace, of happiness, of prosperity. He says, and we shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be crying. So Rabbi Kiva says, it's exactly why I'm laughing. He says, if you look how God pays at the people that are sinning against him, he says, Kal imagine how much he's going to pay to the people that are going to listen to him. He says, the payment is not in this world. The payment is in the next world. Again, the rabbi says, Akiva nechamtanu, Akiva nechamtanu, you have consoled us. We see how Akiva looked, Rabbi Akiva looked at, at his outlook in life. One of the ways in how he became who he became. So, 
uh, while this uh, parade was going on, or a day or so afterwards, there was uh, the Roman, this Roman emperor, to tell you a little bit more, this Domitian, how, how uh, crazy he was, he, um, he invited a bunch of his top government officials. And he was known to like, just like uh, kill you know, government, high government officials like that. Like, oh, whatever, you know, doesn't like the way you look at him, that's it, head off. So they, they come in and they, they, cut, they have the, the invitation. The invitation says, do not bring any servants. Usually you come, you know, you show your, your, your status, you come with your servants, you come there and, you know, they sit there beside you. It says, you're coming alone. So now they're starting to get us scared. Like, why, why all of a sudden does the crazy emperor want us to uh, come alone? So they walk in alone and they get, they let into this room. And then they started getting even more, like, like scared. Because they see this room, is, it, the entire, everything is draped in black. The chairs, this, you know, the chairs are draped in black cloth. There is a lamp that hangs up, it's like a three-pronged lamp that's meant for burial. It's hanged up, you know, hung up on top of them. And uh, they sit down in their appointed seats, and now they're like, okay, you know, this is it. You know, he's coming to kill. This is like, a, you know, everything here hints the burial. And then a bunch of servants walk in. Each person gets their own servant. And there's, they're like dressed like, you know, like ghostly, and they perform this like ghastly, you know, dance in front of these people. And they're like, you know, every time, they're, you know, the heartbeats are starting to go faster and faster and faster. And they're like, okay, wait, you know, just do it already. You know, like the suspense is killing them. So, uh, at, you know, and then they get served. They get served food. But what do they get served? They get served leftovers. It's like, that's it, it's done. Poor, the people that, are, that, are, that, that die, they're the ones that you serve them the, the leftovers, the people that are about to die. While they're eating the, these leftover foods, the emperor walks in, sits down amongst them, and also eats leftovers. He then, he doesn't say anything, he then turns around to them, and he says, no, that I could send you each to your grave if you go against me. This, basically, this is a message. And he said, you could get up and go home. People, you know, the, they were shaking, they ran, they ran right out there. The next day, the emperor, being that he felt like it's a little bad that he scared his, you know, high government officials, he sent them each a present. Each servant that served them was them to, theirs to keep. And not only that, all the dishes that they use are also theirs to keep. Obviously, you're eating by the Roman emperor, you're not eating, you know, the, you know, plastic or porcelain or any, you're eating from, like, solid stuff. So he gave them uh, that as a, as a gift. But still... Didn't stop for people to, uh, you know, from him from killing other people. If, if a fortune teller goes and, and says, like, oh, this person's going to be the next emperor, guess what this Domitian did? Right away, instantly, kill him. So there's no chance. <laughs> I don't think any chance. He goes and he kills him. So this is the time period. This is the time frame of when Rabbi Akiva and, 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 and the Chachamim go into and visit the uh, um, Rome at this point in time. So they go right away. Obviously, who are they going to go? They're going to go to Flavius Clemens, the guy who, who invited them. And uh, the, they, get in, they go right to Flavius Clemens' house. They open up, he welcomes them very, he welcomes them, as you know, he says, he says, my friends and my teachers, and then he starts explaining to them, he says, you know, I'm calling you my teachers because me and Damitella, my wife, we decided we're going to convert. So Rabbi Gamaliel says right away, he says, like, oh, no, no, hold, you know, the conversion is a big thing, you got to think about that thing, you, you got to think about that decision really carefully. He says, you could keep the Sheva Mitzvahs Ben Enoch, keep the seven Mitzvahs Ben Enoch, don't, don't steal, don't murder, you know, don't keep the judicial system, don't blaspheme God, the, you know, the basic seven rules of no, don't eat a, um, a, from a live animal. Basic laws of Noch, and you're going to have a share in the world to come. It says it's very difficult if you're going to come to, to, uh, um, to the Judaism. Meanwhile, they're getting served from his wife and the servants. They served him uh, fruits and vegetables. And the, the Flavius comes and says, says, I know that you're not going to eat by my house because while you should know that my entire house is already kosher. You're already kosher, this entire kitchen, everything was kosher. Uh, he says, but I know, that being that I didn't convert you, you're not going to eat here, so I know that you only eat fruits and vegetables. And he went and he served them uh, uh, fruits and vegetables. So... They start the meeting. They start the meeting. The purpose of they came there, and you know, Domitella, you know, the the um, the niece of the of the of the emperor, the, you know, her emperor was her uncle Domitian. She comes in, and she also you know joins in. And she says, you know, listen, my, my uncle is a great guy. I don't know what got into him. Some you know juke, some bug got into him, and you know went went a little crazy. So. The rabbi says, says, what can we possibly do that we can, uh, you know, avoid this decree? So they said, you know, to be honest, we don't know. This guy is, he's not going to be appeased. And in fact, if you go and you try to befriend him to try to make him, the, the way that he used to do it is, is that before he would kill somebody, he would make them believe they're their best friend. He would treat them like the top guy. That's how people already started realizing that if he treated you well, know that you're next on the list to get killed. So says that we don't really know what to do. He says you can't go befriend him because then he's probably going to just you know, befriend you and then kill you. And you can't, you know, there's, and he says the only thing that we could possibly think about is have him disposed. To, and, you know, by, by having him assassinated. So the rabbis were not, you know, they says, listen, that's in, that's God's, uh, you know, that, that's in God's hands, that's not in, that's not in our hands. But, uh, um, and they were trying to discuss other things of what possible things to do. Meanwhile, the, um, you know, uh, Flavius Clement says, where are you guys staying? 
And they said, you know, they didn't, you know, figure out, they figured one of the Jewish people in the, in the area, they're going to go stay by them. So Flavius comes and says, no, 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 that's dangerous. Says the emperor is going to see a bunch of Jews coming in from Israel, all of a sudden you're going and you're visiting. He says, that's dangerous. He says, I'm going to put, I'm going to put you up with one of my, one of my friends, right? And he had a, he had a very, very high government official, one of the highest sen senators, very close to the Roman emperor, where well, the name was Nerva. And he says, you're going to go and I'm going to arrange to him. He calls his, his servant, uh, Stephanus, which was one, uh, one of his closest servants. And he says, bring them to Nerva and, and with, the, with this message. So they go and they decide they're going to, uh, you know, I guess, wrestle a little bit, go to, to Nerva. So they go into, um, they go into, into uh, Nerva, into the, to one, to one of the senators. And he welcomes them, you know, kindly and warmth. And he says, yeah, of course. And he puts them, and he puts them up. In the middle of the night, that night that they came, Nerva was woken up. One of the servants of the, of the um, Roman uh, emperor wakes him up and he says, there's a secret meeting right now. It's like in the middle of the night. It's so crazy. It's like, wow, why, you know, must be some crazy emergency. Wake him up in the middle of the night. But then, you know, he starts getting, he's like, you know, it's like, what's the coincidence? All of a sudden he's calling me in right when I'm hosting some Jews. So, you know, and he started getting really nervous. This is probably the reason why he called me in. And, uh, you know, to make it, the matter is even worse. The second that he gets in there, who does he see everybody sitting there? Flavius Clemens. He says, oh, there we go. He says, that's it. And his heart is pounding. He says, that's it. I'm done. They're waiting over there. But as they're waiting, for them, more people are showing up. And he sees the entire council is coming up there. So which sort of like calmed him down a little bit, but still gave him a real big shock. And everyone's like, why is the emperor calling us? And they're like, we have no idea. And like, they're sitting around, like, I guess, in the you know, waiting area before the, for the emperor to come. And uh, while they're sitting, they see there is uh, you know, a bunch of servants come in carrying huge fish, huge fish right past by them. And they're like, you know, it's pretty late for, you know, ordering fish, but all right. And a half hour goes by, the emperor comes out, like a, you know, really serious face, like really downtrodden, you know, white, like, a, like, a, like something terrible is on his mind. And the emperor says, says listen, so my gentlemen, my dear friends, it says, I, I, you know, I apologize for waking up in the middle of the night, but uh, there's something that uh, came in that has to be discussed tonight, cannot wait till the morning. So they were like, well, it's crazy, like, what is Roman, you know, is the emperor falling apart, like, what's the big deal, what's the big news that, you know, that he's so serious about it? So he says, um, the emperor goes and he, and, and, and he says, he says, you guys saw that big fish? And they were like, yeah. He says, you know, there was a fisherman who caught his biggest fish in his entire life. And it really bothered him. You know, it, he said he wanted to, he couldn't eat it. He didn't want to sell it. He wanted to do something for the emperor. So he decided to give it to me as a gift, uh, you know, to show him my, uh, you know, his appreciation of the, uh, you know, of me running the government. And he brought me this tremendous fish, but I have a huge dilemma on my hands. He says, I don't have a plate big enough for this fish. And it says, that's why I called you tonight. Should I create a new plate that's big enough for all this fish? Or should I cut the fish up and put it in a bunch of smaller plates? And then he goes, and you know, the people are there. Obviously, they're not putting it. They're like, are you, are you, are you serious? Is this guy? He's like, he's like, this guy's off his rocker. Uh, but obviously, they didn't. They put it on the show, and they were like, obviously, discussing it. Like, oh, you know, this really, you know, you're right. It's a serious matter. It's, of course, very important to it. And they came to the conclusion, you have to get a bigger plate, because it it's not nice to cut in a fish. So he says, thank you very much. And he sends them back. That was the big, the big news. But that actually affected the Jewish, uh, the Jewish Chachamim, the sages, because when he came back, and the next morning he said, listen, he says, I know that had no effect and no bother, but he says, that scare last night scared me. I don't want, any, I don't want to risk anything. The emperor is crazy. I don't want to risk any other idea that there's a Jew hosting my house. He says, I'm sorry. I would love to keep you here, but you guys are going to have to find a different location. So they said, fine. They didn't mind it. They'd rather stay by Jews anyways. They just did it out of honor of Flavius Clement. So they said, by all means, fine, no problem, we'll go. So meanwhile, it was the day, so they go out, and they decide that instead of, you know, going to the place, they said, you know, they had another philosopher, which was very close to the sages, and he said, let's go visit him. Maybe he has some good ideas on what to do with the situation at hand. So they go, and they went to visit this philosopher, and this philo they, they, they uh, you know, they present the whole situation to him, and he says, you know, it's a really serious situation. He says, I don't see a way out. He says, the only way I see a way out is if, you know, the emperor is not emperor anymore. And he says, but I have some advice for you. He says, what I would recommend you do is I found out, a little birdie told me, that, he, that the, the Nerva, the biggest, the most highest, one of the highest government official, he's next on the list on the emperor's to-go list, right, to, to go bye-bye in the next world. So he says, you go tell this to, to Nerva. Maybe that will, you know, spice, you know, speed things up again because all the senators hate this, this emperor. This emperor is one step already in the next world. People are just waiting for him to die. So... He says, maybe this will give a catalyst and maybe something will be able to, and let them deal with it and hopefully they'll be able to dispose of it. So the sages thanked him and they left. They, um, and then they decided, listen, it's not right that, you know, the Nerva, this big senator, just all asked all of us to leave and now we're going to come back to him with more pieces of information. So they decided only one of us is going to go. And they appointed Rabbi Akiva to go to, to Nerva. So 
Rabbi Akiva goes to, to this uh, um, to the senator, to Nirva, and he goes to him and he says, you know, he says, you know, that it was really unnecessary for you to ask us to leave. You know, I know that your fear, but, you know, says your fear is unfounded being that even before we came over here, your name is already on the list to go. So he got really serious, like, what, what do you mean? What do you mean on the, on the list to go? So he's like, he says, you know, we heard from, and they gave him the source. They told him from this philosopher, we heard from this, you know, and, and this source was a legitimate source. So he started getting really nervous. He's like, he's like, that's it. A horrible death awaits me. And he, you know, he's like shaking. He's an older man. He's shaking. He sits down and he says, and then he looks at him. He says, but why did you, why did you come tell me? So was like, what is it to you? So they said, listen, you know, we're, you know, Rabbi Kiva says, we're, you know, the sons of Abraham, so one who loves kindness. And we look out for other people, you know, for that, that, that is one thing. And additionally, he says, uh, you know, you know, I'm sure you're familiar that the, you know, the Domitian, the emperor is, you know, have something not so great in plan for the Jews. So his enemies are our allies. So we figured, you know, we'll come and, and share this bit of information. So the, you know, this, the, the Nerva says, says, listen, he says, I can't even save myself. You think I'll be able to save you? So, and, and Nerva, as he's saying this, he says, it's a shame because I just went to, you know, a fortune teller. And the fortune teller told me from the stars, it looks like, and that I am going to die peacefully in my bed. So Rabbi Akiva heard this. He says, do you have the plaque, you know, I guess the receipt or whatever that says that. And he pulls out, he's like, yeah, yeah, I have it. He says, he says, it's perfect. He says, Domitian, the, the emperor, is a very superstitious man. He's crazy into the stars, crazy into anything that's fortune teller. He says, you let him know that. Let him know that you got a fortune, that you're going to die peacefully in bed. This is going to make him abandon his idea. And Nervo says, I was like, wow, says, that is a genius idea. It's amazing. I didn't even think about that. But thank you very much. And he says, you should know that if it does help me, I'll find a way to repay you. So the very same day that Rabbi Akiva met, you know, met with, met with uh, Nerva, he was called in, they were called in for another secret meeting with uh, the senators, with the emperor. And the emperor, uh, you, know, um, you know, comes in, and he, right away he started be, becoming very friendly to Nerva, as, as was his custom, because he was next to go. And Nerva was very, very, you know, the solemn face, very sad, very depressed, you know. The, and he says, says, my dear friend Nerva, he gives him a big hug, you know. He says, he says what's going on, my favorite senator? Like, why, what's, why are you so down? And he says, to be honest, you know, I, I, I went to a uh, fortune teller and he told me, and he pulls out a plaque, you know, he says, well, you see, look, he told me that I'm going to die soon, in, you know, in my bed. And he says, says can, I, can I take a look at that? And he looks at that and he, and he inspects it and he says, yeah, it looks like he's right. You know, he's like, you are going to die peacefully in your bed. And the Nerva knew the emperor very well and he could see that he already dismissed it from his mind to kill the, you know, Nerva. So he sort of um, relaxed. So they call the meeting together. Everyone settles down. And the emperor comes, starts with his, with his agenda. The agenda is, he says, he says, gentlemen, he says, what should one do if one has a, um, you know, a, uh, uh, a painful abscess, a, a infection, if I may, on a foot? And it's going to spread to the entire body. Should he wait till it spreads or should he go and he should he cut it off? So one of the emperor's, uh, you know, one of the advisors, they, they were there. They were like, listen, obviously, you know, you're talking in riddles, but the right thing to do is to amputate so you could save the rest of the body. And he says, perfect. He says, that's, that's exactly going to be my next point at hand. He says, the Jewish nation, he says, the Jewish nation is a threat to our gods. It's a threat to our survival. He says, you know, they don't worship any of our gods. My, and he says, you know, my, his father, Vespasian, he went and he subjugated them. Titus went and destroyed their temple. But it's still, they're still practicing as Judaism. They're still, they're not giving up. And he says, these are people that are, that are sucking the, you know, the, the, the ability of the whole world to go and, and embrace our gods. So he says, I, I've come to the thing that I want in 30 days' time to come in with a, a, uh, a decree to go and annihilate and destroy the entire Jewish nation. First person to stand up, he says, Flavius Clements. He says, you know, emperor, my dear emperor, he says, uh, um, allow me. And before he even is able to finish, so the, the emperor shuts him up. He's like, blah, blah, blah. you know, like puts his hand down. He says, uh, he says, listen, he says, you shouldn't really be talking. He says, you know, I hear your association with these uh, rotten, you know, Jews. He says, I know that you're, you know, if you weren't my close relative and you weren't married to my niece, you would have been long gone. He's like, sit down, little man. You know, and, you know, Flavius Clevens goes and, you know, not able to say anything, sit down. Nerva goes, and he stands up. He says, figure, you know, he has to pay back. And he says, um, and he says, you know, starts off, you know, great and most powerful emperor. And the emperor stops him also. He says, didn't you uh, want to die peacefully in your bed? He says, why don't you, uh, why don't you also uh, sit down? <laughs> so, he, you know, they sit down. And he looks around the room and he says, you know, I take it that I'm not going to have any, because it has to be passed by the Senate, the, the bill. And one of the ways that the, I guess, the legislation has worked over there. So he says, you know, I'm assuming I'm not going to have any problems. I'm bringing this meeting together so we will have this, uh, uh, wouldn't be any problems when I present this to the, um, to the Senate. And he put an explicit warning, explicitly looking at, at uh, Flavius Clemens, and he says, this cannot be leaked out to anybody. So, uh, if I could bother you for it, thank you. So he goes, and and the the, the thing the, the meeting ended. Who did Flavius Clemens go straight to? 
right to the Sachachamim. And he said, and he said, thank you. And he sent them the message. And he says, you know, it's getting closer. You got to do something. Start fasting. Start praying. Start doing. And the uh, Chachamim realized this, and they start fasting, they start praying, they start, you know, uh, um, doing everything that they can for a tshuva and coming closer to God to hopefully avoid this decree. So 25 out of the 30 days already passed. There's five days left. And Flavius has come and uh, wife, uh, Domitella, goes over to him and he says, uh, you have to do something. You have to do something. The whole entire Jewish nation is going to be annihilated. So he says, what am I supposed to do? He says, I tried, I can't, the guy doesn't let me. So she says, uh, you know, there was a rule that if, the, that if someone from the Senate was not around, they cannot pass anything until, let's say a person died. So there was, they cannot pass any law until they appoint a new senator and until they do that. So he say, she, she was basically saying, so listen, if you weren't to be around, then uh, they would have to appoint, and it's a long process to appoint, and the Jews will have more time to, uh, um, you know, to, to, to find, you know, to be able to, to maybe do something to, uh, uh, you know, move, remove this decree. So he says, you know, are you asking me to what I think you're asking me? And she's like, she's like, she's like, you know, if I, she's what she says, says, if I had the ability to give my life to the Jewish nation, I would do it in a heartbeat. She says, what is this world? She says, the world is over very shortly. You know, and then what? You can have the eternal world in, in the next world. So, she, so he's thinking about that, and he says, um, and he says, you know what? You're right. He says, because if he dies, then they have to go and find a new, a new thing, a new, uh, um, a new senator, and they're going to be able to avoid the decree, at least for the time being. So he says, but at the same time, my dear wife, he says, that the way that the emperor is going to kill me if he finds out that I am, you know, reneging on his whole thing, it's going to be brutal, humiliating, you know, torturous. He says, what am I supposed to do? She says, no, not a problem. She says, I have a ring that has a hollow, you know, the hollow, the diamond's hollow inside. You could go and you could put very, very, you know, serious poison inside over there. And once you have this, this, this poison, the second that you are decreed for death, instead of going through the torture, take the poison and die and then, you know, Shalom Ali Salaam. So he says, fine. He gets the, the ring, he puts a poison inside it, and he goes to the emperor. He visits the emperor and he says, um, and he says, uh, you know, my dear emperor, I came to ask you something very important. He says, yeah, of course, my dear family member, you know, my Flavius Clemens, what, what, what can I do for you? So he says, um, you know, I, I came here to plead on behalf of the Jews. And the, you know, the face of the emperor just changed instantly. And he says, he says, he says, Clemens, he says, you better stop talking right now or you are going to die. Very simply. End of discussion. And, uh, you know, Clemens says, I have no fear of death. He says, uh, you know, he says, I am, and in fact, I'm willing to forego the fact that you're going to forget that I'm married to your niece and that you're going to forget that I'm married to your, uh, that I am your family, but you will not be able to destroy the Jewish nation. He says, they're scattered through the entire empire. You won't be able to bring them down. So, so I'll send people out through the entire empire to bring them down. He says, you're never going to be able to down, and this is going to be your downfall if you go against the Jewish nation. And he started laughing. He says, the Jews, what could they do against me? So he says, the Jews is not who you have to be afraid of. It's their God who you have to be afraid of. And uh, the Domitian replied back to him and says, do you believe in this deity? deity? Do you believe in this God? And he says, in fact, I do. And, you know, he was like, he's like, I'm, you know, I'm very disturbed in what you're telling me, you know, uh, Clemens. He says, and Domitella, share your views, you know, your wife. And she says, she does. She shares the same, same views. And he says, you know, you know, the emperor looks, you know, around, no one's around. He says, listen, Clemens, you're my family member. I love you. Take back your words. I'll make believe it was never said. Don't make me kill you. And he says, he says, if I take back my words, will you avoid the, you know, take, take, get rid of the decree from the Jewish people? And he says, absolutely not. He says, in that case, I'm not going to take back my words. And in fact, I'm going to scream it out to the entire nation, the Jewish people, you know, they're the past, they're awesome, and I'm going to convert to Judaism. And he says, he says, you know, you got mad, Clements. He says, you're crazy. He says, don't do that. He says, I am going to give you the greatest power. I'm going to make you co-emperor. Co-emperor, that's, he says, you're going to be the next emperor. Co-emperor means that you're going to be, the, I'm going to give you all the power possible that you could have ever dreamed of. You'll have money, power, fame, everything. Take back your words. So Clemens replied back and says, listen, at one point, this meant a lot to me. This is all that I dreamed of, the power, the fame, the, the glory, the, everything that I wanted was what exactly you just said. But now, it means nothing to me. He says, he says, you know, I'm going to have to, I'm going to be obligated to present this in front of the Senate, and they're going to sentence you to, to a terrible, terrible death. And he says, I'm fine with that. And he says, in fact, he says, he says, you see this ring over here? He says, I was going to wait till I'd be sentenced to death. And I was going to, and I have poison in here that Damatel and my wife put in for me. And after that, so I would avoid all the humiliating. I was going to go and, and commit suicide, basically, so to avoid all that. But he says, here, he takes the ring. But he says, he says, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to wait. I'm going to sanctify God's name because, from that. 
and um, and and with that, you know, he storms out. But obviously, he gets he gets caught, and they they you know bring him in front of the summit unanimously. They went and they all sentenced him to death. As as he's being led out to to death. Um, you know, there was, a, there was a woman there that says, you know, it's a shame that the ship is going to leave without its captain, which means that he's going to save the entire Jewish nation, but he himself was not converted yet. So on the way, he went quickly and he circumcised himself. He found a sharp rock, found a sharp object, circumcised himself, and he went and he, he announced, and he says, my wealth, he was, he was a very wealthy man, should go to Rabbi Akiva and his colleagues. And with that, they sentenced him to, to a brutal, brutal death. And uh, he died as, as a Jew. When the when the Chachamim when they heard about this they went right away to go and and to uh, um, to be Menachem Arvel to pay condolences to to his wife. So when they reached you know the you know his wife she says you know he did you know he know he did this for you he did this for the Jewish nation and she started explaining the whole thing and you know obviously they were extremely grateful and uh, she also said that you know he gave himself a name his name was was uh, um, Shalom and Ketia it was Ketia Bar Shalom Ketia because he cut it you know from the cutting of the off and that was the name. That, that he gave. And, you know, they say, may his name be blessed forever and ever. May Shalom Katia's memory be blessed forever and ever. So, during this time, this obviously averted the Jewish decree. And the Jews were able to still, you know, until they, um, they got another senator, the, the decree didn't, uh, didn't come, there was, not, there was nothing yet. There was still, there was still uh, you know, all fine and dandy. But during the time, gov high government official, after high government official, were constantly getting killed. And the, the issue that you see, the, the emperor was very smart. What he did was, is he went and he paid the, the, the soldiers very, very high amount of money. Because he knew that he's going to have enemies in the high government officials. So he wanted to make sure that his servants and his, and his soldiers liked him. So the common people, he treated them all with greatest respect. So they all, you know, had his back. But at the same point in time, they went and, they, um, and, and he treated the high elite very, very bad. Because he didn't want any competition, anybody to try to uh, take away anything from him. So he, he was, um, you know, he, he got actually even, you know, more paranoid is that he wouldn't even allow his servants to be with him more than one at a time. So, he, it would be, so this way, you know, because he was a very strong man, he was this way, he would have only, uh, you know, one person at a time and wouldn't be, a, you know, be able to take basically anybody on. And uh, um, so during this time when, when uh, you know, high government official after high government official all dying, they go and the, the high government officials, you know, that are around still, they said, listen, it, you know, we had it up to here and we're done with this guy. He says we're, they were going to go and plan his assassination. And uh, they decided to think about how they're going to do. So they decided they're going to get Stephanus, which was Flavius Clemens' his right hand man, his, his high servant. They, they called him in and they said, um, you know, We've, you know, the, the high government official says, you know, we've come to offer you an opportunity to, re to avenge the, the death of your master. So he says, uh, so he says, no, my master deserved to die. He went against the gods, he went on the whole thing. And they said, they said, relax. They pulled out a piece of paper and they showed that they're also, the people that are around there were on the list, the secret list that were also next going to be done. It says, you could put, take, put your charade down. So he says, oh, you know, he says, in that case, you're my allies. And he says, what can I do, <laughs> you know, to, to, to avenge my, my master? So he says, we're going to get you in there. We're going to get you to be your, the, the servant for the, for the king, uh, for the emperor. And you're going to go and you're going you're gonna to go and assassinate him. So he says, why me? Out of everybody else. He says, because the emperor is a very, very strong man. He says, and you're a very, very strong man as well. And we believe that you're the only one, first of all, A, that the emperor trusts, and B, that you'll be able to take him on. So they arranged it that, um, that, you know, that, that he would get into the, into the, the inner chambers with the, with the emperor. Meanwhile, there was a fortune teller that, you know, produce a fortune that somebody else is going to become, that somebody, not that somebody else is going to become emperor, that the emperor Domitian is going to die on September 18th. So the um, Domitian heard about this. Right away, he calls his for fortune teller, you know, and he's like, you're sentenced to death. There's like, no question asked because you're such a fool. This fortune teller starts laughing. He says, you can sentence me all you want. I read the stars. He says, they, they say my death, I'm going to be torn apart by a bunch of dogs. So the emperor was very, he's like, oh yeah, I'll show you. He says, you got to burn you at the stake. And he says, right now, we're not waiting even. He says, go and, and set up an, a huge uh, a fire. And they set up this huge fire and they tied him onto the stake and they started, uh, they, they lit it up and he started burning. And the emperor was watching, smiling. He says, yeah, this is with you and all your um, prophecies and, and your, and your uh, um, you know, prophetic visions. So uh, he goes, which obviously wasn't prophecy, it was through the astrology, through the stars. But uh, as, as he's smiling and he's watching all this, all of a sudden this, this, this cloud comes by above them. Uh, and I'm, I'm not just like a two by two cloud. I'm going to say, you know, like, uh, you know, like the whole place started and it started pouring, pouring, pouring rain. The entire, um, the entire, the fire was burnt, was, was burnt out. He was severely burnt, but at the same point in time, the strings, the, the ropes that were bound to him were, were getting, you know, so he was able to break free. He was still alive and he started running. Meanwhile, a bunch of dogs came 
and they ripped him apart over there. And you know, the Mishan is sitting over here, he's going crazy. He's like, he's like, and he started getting really nervous. And the dogs, you know, destroyed him, they killed him. But if, he said, if that's if that's true, he says then my prophecy must also be true on September 18th. And he went, you know, put on his paranoia on steroids and he went crazy, nervous, anxiety, couldn't, you know, always be looking over his back. And you know, it, it was it was uh, you know really really bad. Meanwhile, the, they arranged the other side, Stephanos and his crew. They arranged that uh, certain day you're going to go in. Coincidentally, nothing's coincidence, but coincidentally, it happened to be on September 18th as well. Says so you're going to go in, and we're going to arrange that there's not going to be any weapons in there. You're going to be alone with him. You're going to hand him a paper while he's reading the paper. That's when you're going to have a dagger hidden inside you, and that's when you're going to get him. So. Everything went according to plan. He went in there September 18th. Meanwhile, it was like past midday. And, uh, and the emperor said, you know, feeling great, nothing sick. You know, he's checked all his, you know, every, every limb is there. He says, all right, let me take a bath. And as he's getting ready to take a bath, he gets a knock on the door. Stephanos walks in. And he says, you know, he says, Stephanos, you know, my trusty servant, what can I do for you? He says, no, I have just a letter from my dear uncle. And he brings him the letter. As he brings him the, the letter, he takes out under his cloak a dagger and he stabs the, the emperor. The emperor, you know, you know, feels obviously that he gets stabbed. After that, they appoint him as the as the emperor. And the first, one of the first things that he did was he went and he uh, first of all he invited the sages Chachamim back to his uh, to his uh, empire and uh, to the capital. And he 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 uh, minted a coin. On the coin, it said in Latin, it says the accusation against the Jews are canceled. To know that everybody knows that has that it's all been canceled. And he showed to them. He also he put a palm tree, which symbolizes Judaism. He put things that that you know very very obvious that. Uh, um, and he was actually very good for the Jews. However, he didn't uh, rule for for a long time, maybe a year and a half or something, maybe a little bit more than a year and a half uh, that he ruled. And and he was followed. He actually ad- he didn't have any children. He adopted a person by the name of Trojan, uh, Trajan. I'm sorry, Trajan. Trajan. Um, he uh, you know after after he was sort of became also like a co-emperor, and then he became emperor after Nerva's death. He uh, took over as the empire. Now, the um, you know Trajan, this Trajan did not have a good liking towards the Jews because when he was 16, his father had put a siege around this Jewish, Jewish uh, uh, city, and this Jewish city was very, very strong and fought back, you know, fiercely at this at this Roman army. And in his father and him, you know, they, they suffered tremendous losses in the army. So he always had a dislike towards the towards the Jews. But to make matters even worse, the um, you know they. One day, when when the when he had a a baby, uh, it was it turns out it was I think it was a it was a boy if I'm not mistaken. He had a baby and was weeping. Was a little later, his his The celebration turned, you know, very, you know, towards, uh, towards, to you know, some of the Jews that are going to be going to impose the same restriction. Rabbi, which is Rabbi Yeshua. So, it's Rabbi Yeshua ben Hanania. So, um, Rabbi Yeshua ben Hanania, let me tell you a little bit about Rabbi Yeshua ben Hanania. He was a very, he, he, like the stars, he was a, a expert on the stars. He, um, you know, one time him and Rabbi Gamliel were traveling. And Rabbi Gamliel, you know, they all packed provisions. You know, you don't, now you go and, you know, you travel. So you have hot food delivered to you. And you have, you know, over there you have to bring whatever food that you are. And, you know, there's no kosher menu. You can, you know, ask for the glot menu. So uh, they go and they pack their own thing. And the trip took longer than expected. Rabbi Gamil packed his regular bread. Rabbi Yeshua, he packed bread, but he also packed, packed flour and dough. So when Rabbi Gamliel did, the trip took much longer than expected. And Rabbi Gamliel went and he says to Rabbi Shua, do you mind sharing with me your, your provisions? He says, yeah, absolutely. I, I brought more on purpose. So he says, how did you know? How did you know that the trip is going to take longer than anticipated? It never usually takes this long. So Rabbi Yeshua, who was a specialist in astrology, he knew a lot about the stars. He said, there's a certain star that every 70 years, he, it travels through the, through the system. And um, the, it, it confuses the sailors because they, and, and it gets them, it takes them off track. Because they, you know, they, and I knew that according to my calculations, the star is supposed to happen now. And I figured because of that, they're going to get taken off track because that's how they used to navigate. And then it's going to take some time. So I figured I planned in it uh, accordingly. Incidentally, the, uh, there is a, um, you know, in uh, the year, uh, the early 1700s, there was a person by the name of Edmund Haley. He uh, later went and he, uh, I don't want to say found Haley's Comet. 
he, Haley's Comet. Haley's Comet is something that comes every 70 years, and he called it Haley's Comet. There's a rabbi, chief rabbi of Prague, Rabbi Rappaport, that's uh, also in the, in the, in the um, early 1800s, about a, about a maybe 70 years after, after, after Edmund Haley, he went and he proved how Rabbi Yeshua star was actually that Haley's Comet as well. He went and he was able to, to, to prove it as well. So in any case, this is, this is Rabbi Yeshua. So Rabbi Yeshua, um, one time there was, a, a, let me, I have to give you now a different background. The way that they used to decide a new month was they used to see a, the, first of all, the month, uh, the Jewish month goes by the lunar calendar, which is every roughly 29 and a half days. So they would make a calculation, a rough calculation, but at the same point in time, they needed additional, because the calendar wasn't perfected, they needed an additional thing w- which they would see, which they would have two witnesses go and look at the new moon. Once the witnesses come and they see the new moon, they see the, the, the first new moon, they go and they testify in front of court, and because of that, they go and they institute a new month. This, this is very, very important in Judaism because it tells us when Yom Kippur is, for example, when Pesach is going to be. Because if, let's say, the, the, they come in and they, if, let's say, they're lying, and there's false witnesses, which, were, which there was, then it would make Yom Kippur on a day that's not Yom Kippur. So people will be carrying on a day that's not, that's not Yom, Kippur, that's, uh, Yom Kippur, and fasting on a day that's not Yom Kippur. So it's obviously it's it's uh, you know it's tremendous uh, that has uh, uh, you know tremendous uh, you know results and influences that these these uh, these uh, uh, witnesses would have to the to the Jewish calendar. And what they used to do, so how, let's say they would come in, the Jews, two Jewish witnesses would come in. How would they get? You know, there's no email. They can't be like, okay, everybody, you know, send out a quick SMS to everybody, all the big people. Tell all your congregants that tonight's Yosh Chodesh. How would they get that? So they used to have mountains, and on the mountains they would have people stand there, and they would light fires. And when the person, you know, from the next mountain saw the fire, he lighted a fire in his mountain. And within like a, a few hours, the entire Israel, all the mountains were lit in with fire. So tell everybody that Rosh Chodesh is now. That the sages Chachamim did is later they, they abolished this this uh, practice because there was tzedukim tzedukim were the people that only listened to the to the written Torah not to the biblical Torah so they used to they they you know like you know they said that Shavuot was only be on Sunday they did they had their own the crazy calculations and they went and they tried to fake it so they went on mountains and they also went to the thing so people just got confused and they abolished it but during this time whatever it was still it was still going and uh, so there was two witnesses that come in and they say that you know there was a Rosh Chodesh uh, they, they saw the new moon. Rabbi Gamil goes and, you know, they, they obviously they make sure that they're real witnesses and it, it passes. The next night, however, there was no moon. There was a clear night and there was no moon. So Rabbi, Gamil, Rabbi Yeshua says it must be that they lie. They're false. And according, to, you know, and according to his calculation, it makes sense. However, Rabbi Gamliel, which was the Nazi, which was the leader of the generation, he says, no, he says it matches his calculation. He says, still, I, I think that, they're, that they are right and we're still instituting Rosh Chodesh according to their calculation. So when Rabbi Gamliel found out that Rabbi Yeshua which is, this was Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Akiva's rabbi, was going to hold on his calendar, not on Rabbi Gamliel's calendar. He ordered Rabbi Yeshua to come in, and he says, he says, I want you to come to me on Yom Kippur with your stick, which means I want you to carry, and your purse. Because when, when you think it's your Yom Kippur, and not, not whenever, because says you have to follow one, and, and the reason, this is a very important thing, because you can't have all of a sudden two people doing two different Judaism, two Yom Kippur. It's a very, very important thing. But Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Yeshua is very downtrodden. He says, but it's wrong. He says, according to my calculations, he didn't, obviously didn't say anything. He just, you know, he left. And his, his student, Rabbi Akiva, saw him, and he says, Rabbi, why, why are you so down? And he says, you know, to be honest, he says, I'd rather be, you know, sick the entire year than have to go and do, you know, follow the, you know, Rabbi Gamil's command and go carry on Yom Kippur. So he says, Rabbi Akiva says, allow me, my dear teacher, to tell you something that you once taught me. He says, please speak. So Rabbi Akiva goes and he says that um, when the Torah speaks about the holidays, it, spe- it says, Otam, them, these holidays. But the word Otam is written three times without the letter Vav, Spelling and pronouncing it as atem, which means you. And he says, he says, what you once told us. He says, and the reason is that if the chachamim, well, let's say the chachamim make a mistake. Let's say they make a mistake and they make Pesach a wrong day. They make Yom Kippur a wrong day. The Torah says that regardless, it's the right day. Because if the chachamim come in together and they say this is the day, it's the right day. And we learned that from the from the different uh, the words that it's that it's spelled with atem you, atem you, which means it's you, the chachamim. When you make this, the, the, the holidays, that's when the holidays are going to be. So, Rabbi Shul goes over to the students and says, Rabbi Akiva, you consoled me. He says, you, make me, you, made, me feel, uh, you made me feel better. Uh, so, as you can see, even Rabbi Akiva was able to go and, uh, unbelievable, I don't have to say anything, I don't have to explain it. Awesome! One word, awesome. So, um, and, and to, when Rabbi Yeshua went, then went, and the story was, he walked to, on the day that he said that he was going to be on Kippur, which is not the right day, which is a, what not what Rabbi Gamliel thought was the right day, he came in with his staff, with his purse to Rabbi Gamliel. Rabbi Gamliel stood up, hugged him and kissed him, and he says, blessed are you my student and my teacher. My student because you listen to me, 
And my teacher, because you're wiser than me, he knew that you're wise about the stars and everything like that, he says, you're, you're, you're wiser than me. So you see the Chachamim back then, there was no argument for Kavot. It wasn't like, no, I'm the boss, you listen to me. It wasn't because of that. It was, there was a reason that he had to do that. I don't know. That obviously, there can't be too many you know, different you know, people serving, you know, ha having two different days of Yom Kippur. So, it was obviously a reason, and obviously, you know, Hashem, you see how the Chachamim, there was nothing about their own honor. It was only about the Torah and what was correct. So, um, by the way, we're going to keep on, we're going to go in for a little while longer. So, if you guys need to go, by all means, you know, feel free. So, I want to make this a three-class series, so, as much as I possibly can. Okay, so, there's a Gemara, a crazy Gemara. We're not going to get into this, but there's a Gemara Chagiga. It says it was four people that entered the Chesula Pardes. They entered the orchard. The orchard, you know, we're not going to get into the depths of what they actually did, but they entered into the very, very deep mystical parts of the Torah. Remember, this is before the Zohar. The Zohar was actually written down. This is right before, but this is, the, they're talking about the crazy, you know, really, 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 really into the, into the depths of the Torah, of, this, of the secrets of the Torah. Four people went into this. You had, you had Ben Azai, Ben Zoma, Acha, and Rabbi Akiva. Four went in, only one came out, a hundred, the way that he came in. Ben Azai went in there and he passed away. He didn't make it out. Ben Zoma went in there and he went mad. Acha went in there and he went off the dark. He became a heretic. Rabbi Akiva was the only one out of the four that went in in peace and came out in peace. He was able to, you know, was able to with, his, with his abilities, he was able to go in and go out. Again, there's tremendous, you know, beautiful insights that, and, uh, on this, but it's not for the scope of today's uh, shiul. There's also like, to, to, just a shiul about Acha is also very, very fascinating. But in any case, Rabbi Akiva, you could tell that his knowledge was, was all over the Torah. And we spoke about also his knowledge was in medicine, in science, in astrology, in mathematics, everything. He, he learned from everybody and he, and he, and he uh, um, it, you know, used the, this knowledge for the good. And in fact, when he used to go to like these certain towns, he used to actually prescribe medications. And again, there wasn't a prescription, but he actually says, this is going to be good for you, this is going to be good for you. Um, and people used to come to him sick and he would actually act as like a, like a sort of like a doctor. So there was once a guy who came with a shovel and he says, you know, Rabbi, he says, why are you messing with God's work? He says, God made this guy sick. How dare you go and, and, and heal this person? So Rabbi Kiva goes and answers and says, what's your profession? I see you hold a shovel. He says, I'm a, I'm a gardener. You know, I plant and I, you know. He says, what makes you uh, mess with God's work also? He says, you know, you're, you're touching the ground. Who says you can touch the ground? So the guy says, all right, you got me. And he walks away. But the students, say, the students that were standing around him, he says, no, but he has a point, Rabbi. He says, we know that Chizkiyahu, he did some of the things and he got praised for. He hid, there was a certain book. It was a book of all the medicine. If you, if you had any sickness, you open the book, see exactly what it does, instant healed. Cheskiah went and he hid it. Why did he, why did he hide it? He hid it because people stopped relying on God. People have to realize that if something bad happens, you have to do an introspection. You have to look into yourself. Why did God cause this to me? Obviously, you go and, and you, know, you have to do what you have to do. But at the same point in time, you should always look about why bad things happened. Why? What's the reason for it? So, the, um, so, so people, when they had this book, they didn't even bother looking bad. They were like, oh, forget it. Let's look at the book. What do we got to do? All right, do this. One, two, three. Take this, the, the, uh, these concoction. They would drink it, and they would become completely healed. So Chizkiah went, and he, and he hid it. So he says, he says, Rabbi, he says, maybe in the same case, he says, that's why you shouldn't be also healing people. Let them go and do an introspection. So Rabbi Kiva said, he says, oh, listen, he says, you know one reason why Chizkiah hid, hid the book, but there's another reason why he hid the book as well. He says uh, that our people that are, the, you know, as, as, a, as a society, and not even a society, as the, as the human race, they constantly change over time. There's different, era, the, the era changes, there's, um, you know, the, the people, they live longer, they live shorter, the, the things are changing in the world. The medicine that worked back then wouldn't work anymore. He says, that's why Rechizkiah also Rechizkiah hit it. Because it wouldn't work anymore. The people's changed. The metabolism changed. Their, their everything, everything changed. Everything would not work the same. And that's also why he hit it. But absolutely. He says, we know that God gave the, the power for the, for the doctors to heal. And people are supposed to go and go to the doctors to heal it. But at the same point in time, you're right. You have to go and do an introspection. You have to realize why God caused this uh, sickness uh, uh, to you. So, the, um, like we said before, the... Um, the, the the new emperor, Trajan, he went and he imposed heavy taxes. He had, he had a dislike for the Jews, especially about what happened with his, with his children. So he imposed a heavy tax for the, for the Jewish nation. And there was word going around the Jewish nation that it, it was crazy, that they wanted a re to, to usher a rebellion. They wanted to get the rebellion, get him, get him a, a off it. All the Chachami met and they said, listen, it's not going to work. He says, the Jews are going to die if they make the rebellion. It's not going to work. We have to wait for the, you know, the next redeemer, which is Mashiach. We cannot go and do this. So 
Rabbi Kiva made it his mission to go and travel around the world, and he literally, you, you see his travels, he went all over the place. Wherever there were Jews, he traveled. And traveling back then, you know, wasn't like, you know, all right, let me take a first class trip to, you know, to wherever I need to go. It's dangerous on the seas, you know, chances of survival are slim. And he went and he, and he traveled all over the world with the Jewish nation, uh, where, where the Jewish people lived, and to warn them, especially under the Roman rule, do not rebel. Do not rebel, it's not going to end well. So one of the places that he went to was Alexandria. Alexandria was in Egypt. It was named after Alexander the Great, and it was a, it was a very, very uh, huge Jewish community. In fact, it was a very, very famous um, Jewish synagogue over there. This is the famous Jewish synagogue that if somebody, uh, it was so big that the Chazan, when he, would, when he would pray, the people couldn't hear him at the other end of it. There was a, somebody had to raise a flag and went to say amen, went to say amen, that's, that's how huge it was. Tens of thousands of people were able to fit into this place. It was very, very large, magnificent. Uh, there were very wealthy Jews over there. And um, so Rabbi Kiva goes and he makes a visit over there to Egypt, over there to Alexandria to go and warn them, do not rebel. But when he walks into Alexandria, he, what it, it shocks his mind. He says, these Jews look exactly like the Greeks. And he notices, no Shabbat, no kosher. They're like, like what, what's going on over here? What? So he goes over to the leader of the generation. The leader of the generation was a very, very wealthy man. He gets to his, to his house and he sees, you know, this guy is like a Roman palace he has there. Like, it fits for, for royalty. And he comes inside and he gets, you know, he looks at the walls, like, you know, Rome, uh, Greek poetry, you know, arts, and, you know, hanging from the wall. Well, says, where's this Farim? You know, where, 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 what's going on over here? And he walks into this thing and he sees this, like, middle-aged man reclining on a couch, eating, like, reading this Roman book, you know, eating, eating uh, grapes. And he says, ah, oh, Rabbi Akiva! You know, he says, oh, your name has traveled throughout the entire world. My dear rabbi, what, what gives you uh, the pleasure of hosting you, the, big, the great rabbi? So he says, you know, I came here. Um, because uh, even before that, he says, "Come, I'll go and I'll and I'll feed you some food. We're gonna have a nice meal, and you tell me what it is." Rabbi Kiva, right away, you know, doesn't play any games. He says, uh, "He says, unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to eat any of your food." He says, "With all this going around over here, I doubt your food is kosher." He says, "I'm not touching any of your food." He comes into this guy's house and gives him musa like the way he's supposed to give musa. You know, I'm not scared of anybody. So he comes in. He says, "He says, I don't understand." So he come to my house to insult me. He says, this is why you traveled around to come here and insult me? So Rabbi Kiva says, no, to be honest, what a reason why I came here for was I came here to tell you that, you know, I know the taxes are extremely high, the Roman government, and there's word of rebellion. I came here to tell you, do not rebel. It is not what the, you know, you should not do it. This is what you should not, you should not be doing this at this point in time. But now that I came here, I see where's Shabbat, where's, where, what's going on over here? And I have another job, and that's the job of Tocha, to rebuke you. I have to rebuke you and the entire thing. But, you know, so he went in, and, and Rabbi Akiva was such a good orator. He spoke so well and fluent Greek that, you know, he was, you know, the, like he tried to, you know, like, so this guy tried to talk him, but Rabbi Akiva, like, answered everything he went, like, you know, right back at him. Very, very smooth talker. So he says, uh, he says, listen, he says, you know, we, 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 you know, we follow God. You know, we, we still believe in one God. We don't follow. We make fun of the Roman, the Roman God, the Roman uh, gods. He says, uh, he says that's nice. But what happened to all the rest of the Torah? He says, no, over here we're liberal over here. You know, we, you know, we're up with the times. He says, listen, Rabbi. You know, we do Judaism to a certain extent, but you know, you know think times have changed. You know, we're modern. So. He says, uh, he says uh, you know, there's no such thing as change in the Torah. The Torah is the way it's supposed to be. So he says, he says, listen, he says, you know, your views are different than mine. He, this is what he tells Rabbi Kiva. Rabbi Kiva looks at him and says, he says, there's no different views when it comes to these things in the Torah. He says, there's only one view and it's, uh, there's only the Torah. And so he really puts this, the, the leader and the generation in the corner and says, Rabbi, fine, Rabbi, what do you want me to do? He says, the Rabbi says, I want you to arrange a whole meeting with the entire, with the entire town. I want to speak to them. So he says, fine, you're a stage, you have the stage for Shabbat afternoon. Well, we'll call everybody in, big rabbi, Rabbi Akiva coming from Israel. You go and you speak Shabbat afternoon. He waits, he waits there for Shabbat and um, comes and the place gets packed, packed, packed to the brim. And they even, they were worried, how is Rabbi Akiva's voice going to travel? Rabbi Akiva didn't have a problem with that. He was a tall man, strong man, strong voice. He started speaking. And he started giving them strong Musa. He started giving them stories from Ninveh, from a, from a place that is wicked. And he says, I've come over here from, 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 you know, to warn you guys. You guys are heading down the wrong path, and it's only a matter of time before divine punishment will come to you. He says, I'm, war I'm warning, I'm begging, please come back to Torah. And he gives, and he gives a strong, I don't, we don't have time to go through the whole uh, thing, but he brings in the story from Ninveh, how this, this non-Jewish non -Jewish nation went, and, the, and Yonah, the prophet, went over and, and rebuked them, and they went, and they did tshuva, and they got saved. So to you, even though that you went so far out from Judaism, come back and you too will be spared. And people were, you know, he was a great orator, a great speaker, really touched their hearts. And really, you know, they started crying. They said, Rabbi, please, please stay with us. Tell us, teach us what to do. But the leaders of the, of the community, they had other plans. They went over to the rabbi and says, nice speech. 
He says, but you're, uh, you know, you're going on our territory. He says, you're either going to leave or we're going to make you leave. He says, because this is, not, this is going to infringe in our territory. We, live, we like the way we live right now. And I guess the people weren't strong enough to fight up against these people. And they basically pushed Rabbi Kiva out. And you know, so Rabbi Kiva was preparing for his trip back home to, to, um, to Eretz Yisrael. And he knows, great day, beautiful day. So he went out to a ship. It was actually a ship that was, uh, I believe, was delivering papyrus, uh, which was like a paper, parchment. And he goes and he sets sail. And being that he also is, he has the wisdom of the sailors of the sea, which we spoke about in the last class, also he always asked that anywhere that he was, he always found out the knowledge of whatever that person was. And he noticed in the distance was a very small but dark cloud. And he goes over to the captain and he says, you see that cloud over there? He says, it doesn't look too good. I think we should find a, you know, find a dock and, and wait it out. So the, guy, the captain looks at it and start, looks at this you know, Jewish rabbi, you know, big you know, bearded guy. He's like, he starts laughing. He says, Judean. He says, you think you can tell me how to run my ship? He says, that's nothing to worry about that. I've been sailing the seas for plenty of time. Don't worry about that. And he says, we're going to continue on, on course. So um, they, uh, you know, as true to Rabbi Akiva's worries, he goes in and he sees this, you know, this, this cloud and it gets closer and closer. And then a cr- you know, wave start coming up high. And this crazy storm breaks, uh, breaks out. And so much so that the actual, the ship breaks. The ship breaks and people get scattered. People are, you know, throwing over. And Rabbi Akiva only survived, but he was able to float on a piece of floating, you know, material that was from the ship. And he was able to float to a nearby, um, a nearby um, uh, island. While he was, and when he finally, um, when he finally landed on the island, um, he right away, you know, he, he, you know, recuperated a little bit, and he right away made his way back to, uh, to Israel because he heard from the island that everybody heard that he was on that ship, and the ship di- crashed, and everybody died. So because they saw the floating debris, so they sent word out that Rabbi Kiva didn't make it. So he says, your, you know, your whole family, your whole students, your, your whole yeshiva is probably mourning for you. So he set sail right away, re- went right to, to, uh, to his hometown. Right away, he went straight to the Bet Midrash. And people were like mourning for him. And then he, in walks in Rabbi Akiva. So he explains to them the whole situation. But then they said, you know, like, look at that. You just answered a question that we had. So we had a question. You were gone. We heard that the ship died. But we didn't see your body. Nobody saw your body. So we had the question, is your wife allowed to go and remarry now? Or because, you know, we heard that you died. But now that it shows us that we could see that even if we hear somebody dies, we see that we cannot allow an aguna, somebody who is not a wife, who we don't know the status of her husband, we cannot allow her to get married. Because we don't, just like you said, so Chazaku then we were able to, um, you know, to, to get this, uh, and that's why they made a decree nowadays. That's why if, you, if a man is missing, you have to actually have witnesses or, or you know, to hire power uh, that is definite that this person is no longer alive. Because if, let's say, he's still alive, then she gets married, she's a, she's a married woman. Married, you know, being, and if they have a children now, they're mamzerim. So it's a, it's, there's a big, uh, big problems that can result in, uh, in this. Meanwhile, the, um, as much as, as, uh, as Rabbi Akiva tried, the, the rebellion went out. And the rebellion went out, and it did not work well, just like Rabbi Akiva you know, thought it would. And the blood flowed. The entire Alexandria, the part of Egypt, it was, it was demolished. The big synagogue, the big famous synagogue was destroyed. The river, the, it was a river of blood from the women, men, women. No one, no one got spared. And, you know, that, you, know, Traj- you know, the end wasn't so good for the, for the Jews um, under the Trajan's uh, rule. Which, by the way, look at, look at what Rabbi Akiva is going through in his life, one after another. You know, keep on going down. There's going to be another one afterwards, Hadrian. Meanwhile, the, well, speaking about him, he is the next emperor. Trajan, uh, you know, died, uh, you know, a while after that, and, and Hadrian was, became uh, the, new, the new emperor. The, uh, in the beginning, Hadrian was actually quite favorable towards the Jews. Maybe about 10 more minutes, we should be done. Uh, Hadrian, maybe even less. Hadrian was, was actually uh, um, very uh, favorable to the Jews, but that was in the, in the beginning. The... Now I have to share with you this, so being that it's getting late, I want to, this is um, the, you know, Rabbi Akiva, the way that when he learned, he always went and he always like asked his rabbis, no matter the situation, he always went and he asked them, you know, questions or, or so that he could learn, uh, you know, even, <clears throat> they were traveling once, oh yeah, this would work, thank you. He was traveling once, and uh, he was actually, they were actually buying with Rabbi Gamliel. They were buying um, meat for his, for his child's wedding. So Rabbi Akiva went, and Rabbi Akiva started asking him a question. Listen to this question. It's like a riddle. It's amazing. Um, he says, uh, and the Rambam, I'm going to explain to you how the Rambam explains this question, because it's a question. It's so hard to even understand. He says, and I'm not going to tell you the way that it's phrased in the, in the, in the, in the Gemara, because that is even, even harder to understand. I'm going to give you the easy translation and see if you can still figure it out. Rabbi Akiva goes to Rabbi Gamliel. While this is what they're doing while they're shopping for, for meat. And he says, what's the story if a man sleeps with a single woman who is at the same point in time his sister, the sister of his father, and the sister of his mother? He says, he says what's, which means is, is he liable for each 
Oh. For each, for each, uh, you know, thing, or is it all one and one and together? But that's the question that he asks. So Rabbi Gamaliel, obviously also very sharp, says, "Oh, we never had that case." But he says, "Well, we're li- he's liable for each and every one." But now let's try to explain that case because it's phenomenal. So let me repeat that again. A man sleeps with is with a single woman who is his sister, the sister of his father, and the sister of his mother. So how is that possible? Look at the brilliance mind of these chachamim and how they work. So watch this. So, um, okay. So there's a guy, right? This is a guy who is going to be this M over here, and whoever's listening just online. I'll speak it out so you don't have to actually watch it. This is the M. This is the man. He goes and he has relations with his mother. Okay? And from that, um, he has two kids. Right? We'll call her girl one and girl two. Then, this guy goes and has relations with one of his daughters. Right? It's very hypothetical. This is not a real case, but this is a hypothetical thing. But look, so he, this guy has relations with one of the daughters, and he has now a son. Now this son goes, this is his mother, this son goes, and he has relations with his, this person, this G2, the, the, um, the, other, the, other, the, other, the other woman. So look, at the same time, it's his sister, because they, they, um, they share the same father. It's his mother's sister, and it's his father's sister also, because it came from this relation. So this is the question that they're at. You, you, you understand this so far? Isn't it crazy? It's a great riddle, right? You can speak about it on dates. Uh, no. <laughs> so probably wouldn't recommend it, um, especially not on the first date. But, um, but it, it's phenomenal. And here, if the, if the camera wants to see it, I don't know if they could you know, see that from there, whatever it is. But um, it's, yeah. Whatever it is. Okay. But in any case, it's, it's phenomenal. Look at how the, the hachamim, they're going. This is not one that... I have to sit over here, a quiet classroom setting. We have to get this little blackboard, and I have to start drawing things. And then you're like, oh, yeah, this, oh, there it is. And that's how you get it. While they're walking, going to buy meat, this is, what this is the Torah, how they're, how they're speaking about it. So, so you see Rabbi Akiva went and he was learning constantly. This was his thing. This is, first of all, this is a tremendous lesson. You're going, you're traveling, you're on the train, you're going to the city, whatever it is that you're traveling. You're driving a car, learn. You learn to You want to become great? Learn. Learn from the great people. Learn from the great people. You're constantly learning to You're sitting there in the car, you, 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 you have an app, you sync it up to Torah anytime. You go and you start listening to Shum. There are great speakers there. They have, they have so many, so many, so many speakers. There's so many different. You could find somebody that you're going to like. Even if you don't like one person, you'll find somebody else that you like. And, you know, and also, give other people chances. You never know. You might you just pick some random person. You might actually like that person and start listening, listening to that person. So, but the, the technology and the ability for us to learn to lot is always like that. You didn't have Rab, Rabbi Akiva. How was he learning? He had Rabbi Gamliel, a walking Sefer Torah, walking that with him. So he was constantly asking him questions. But... Nowadays, you could use this, this little you know, devil device of a phone for either the good or the bad. You have the ability to go learn, learn, and you can learn constantly also with him. You're in the street, put headphones, you're learning to walk. Driving, eating, whatever it is that you're doing, walking, enjoying, you can be constantly learning to walk, and you'll gain so, so much. But in any case, so um, a short while later, Rabbi, uh, after his son's wedding, Rabbi uh, Gamliel's son's wedding, which was what he was buying the meat for, he, uh, he got sick. And he, um, at, until this time, people used to get buried in very, very expensive clothing. And it became a very, very expensive ordeal to bury somebody. Rabbi Gamliel, who had money, but he says, I want to be buried in plain white shrouds. Tachachim, which is nowadays what, what the custom is to do now with no, nothing fancy, because it was very, getting very difficult for people to bury people. It was, very, it was a big expense. As it is, it's a big expense. You know, a burial plot is a lot of money. So he made the decree that uh, from then on, and then people started listening. Everybody was always buried in white, uh, simple uh, tachachim, white uh, crowd. But shortly after Rabbi Gamil, Rabbi Eliezer, which is Rabbi, um, Rabbi Akiva's also as other, his other rabbi, became sick. And people went to visit him. And, you know, people were there, were sitting there, were crying. And Rabbi Akiva was smiling again. So they were like, like you know, Akiva, was like, why are you smiling? You're a rabbi. You know, he, says, um, he says, you know, because, you know, I always seen Rabbi Eliezer. And everything he touched turned into gold. He had an, you know, business success. Everything was success. I was like, you know, maybe Chasu Shalom, he's getting his reward in this world. But now that I see that through his, you know, through his last moments, he's actually suffering a little bit, I know that he has, he has reward in the next world. So Rabbi Elazar heard this and says, Rabbi Kippa, what, what, you know, what is it that you said? That you said? So he says, you know, you know, suffering is good. Suffering is good, Rabbi Kippa says. And he says, he says, why suffering good? He says, to atone for sin. So his rabbi goes and says, do you think I sinned? Right, you know, I keep Rabbi Akiva. So Rabbi Akiva says, only what you told me. He says, there's nobody ever that, you know, that's around, that's alive now, that doesn't sin. And he says, you know, Akiva, you know Rabbi Akiva, again, you consoled me. You uh, made me feel uh, good. So 
um, you can see even how Rabbi Akiva was able to go and consult his um, his his uh, his teacher. The um, I'll tell you even another another short, short story. And we'll end with uh, with with that is that the um, Rabbi Akiva um, one time was walking in the street and he noticed uh, it was the street. He was walking somewhere and he noticed this guy who's like like in black and coal, like, like, like very, very not so, you know, like, like out of this world type of a situation. And he sees him, you know, holding a bunch of wood and running at the speed of the horse. You know, like really like crazy fast. So he stops and he's like, my, you know, my son is like, what's going on? Are you, is everything okay? And he says, uh, um, you know, if let's say you're, if it's your slave and I'll, and I'll, you know, I'll purchase you. So if this is how you master, if this is how you master, um, goes and, and, you know, so, so I'll, I'll save you from that. And he says, if it's, if it's because you're a property, I'll give you some money. He says, you know, it's so dear, I saw a Jewish guy, he says, my dear child, what can I do to help you? So he says, he says, please, he says, let me go at once, be, uh, you know, because a demon's going to come, he's going to continue torturing me. So he says, what's going on over here? So he says, uh, you know, he's, he's not in this world anymore. And because of this person who was a very, very big sinner. So I believe he was a tax collector. He was a very, very big sinner. Nobody liked him. Consistent sense, and he is due to punishment. And you know, constantly, you know, creating, um, you know, uh, you know, bringing the, the wood for his fire. And if he comes and he's late, the you know, they come and the, the mazikim go over there, go and they, and they torture him. So Rabbi says, "Is there anything that I can do to alleviate your suffering and your pain?" So he says, "Yeah, I once overheard the you know the the mazikim. They go and they they said you know if there was if this person which was which was him says if he had a son and his son said kaddish for him that would be able to go and, and alleviate him." So he says, "Do you have a son?" He says, "So the, this this uh, this man said, uh, you know, to be honest, I don't know." I says, "When I, when he passed away, his wife was pregnant, but he doesn't know what happened with that." Again, he was like in the in the midst of the world. He wasn't in the next world yet. So. He says, okay, where are you from? And he gave him, says, I'm from this town. My name is this. I come from this town, and my, you know, my wife's name is this as well. And he goes, and the Rabbi Kiva goes, and he travels to his, uh, to his town. And he travels, and he, says, and he starts asking around for this guy. And he says, what do you, you know, this guy's the biggest, a shah, biggest, what do you want with him? He says, do you know, does he have, does he have a wife? Does he have a child? He says, yeah, he has a, some sort of child. that's just following his footstep also. A big shah also going in his way. So he goes in, and he meets with the son. And he meets with the son and he says, listen, he says, he says I'm going to teach you, I'm going to teach you to say Kaddish. I'm going to teach you to say, this guy didn't even know alphabet. So he went and Rabbi, he, he convinced him, he convinced his son to go and, and, to, and to start learning and to start, you know, learning how to read. So he could go and say Kaddish for his father. And um, he goes and he starts teaching him and teaching him and teaching him. The problem was, it was nothing there. Everything, it bounced, it deflected. He had a shield, you know, bing, bing, everything, everything, everything that came, it went right out. He couldn't, couldn't uh, acquire anything. What did Rabbi Kiva, whoa, no, what was it? I tried. I tried to help, really, but you know, when Rabbi Kiva tries, he tries. Not like somebody would be like, okay, you know, I'm free from 9 to 10, you know, on the Tuesday nights, you know, why don't you come over here and I'll, uh, I'll help you learn over there. Rabbi Kiva really tried. Didn't work, didn't give up. Rabbi Kiva went and he fasted for this person. For 40 days, he fasted that, this, that God should open this person's mind, he'd open his heart so he'd be able to understand the Torah, he'd be able to start, to start reading. And, and that worked. And that actually worked. He went and he, uh, he, went and he was able to, to go and teach this person to say Kaddish. Uh, there was a Batko that came out and it says, you know, it says, why did you trouble so much for this person, Rabbi Kiva? Why? why what the? And he says, this is just opposite. These are the people that you need to be troubled for. These are the people that need it. And he went and, and shortly after that, his father came to Rabbi Akiva and he says, thank you. You consoled me also. He consoled people when they're alive. He consoled people when they're dead. But he cared for every single Jew, no matter, even the biggest sinner. Even the biggest sinner, he went and he brought them back to 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 Torah. And this is this is who Rabbi Akiva was. This is what he constantly strived for. And this is why he one of the reasons he became so great. He became the greatest. Unbelievable. Even so the, the Torah could have been brought, uh, you know, through him. So Moshe um, Rabbeinu. But uh, shortly, you know, after that, about fifty years has passed or more since uh, Rabbi Akiva married his wife Rachel, and she became sick. And uh, she became sick, and you know they realized that the time was near, and you know they brought the family together, and um, they they more you know, and, and she passed away, and they gave her a eulogy, really you know like you know Chachamim really this is a you know eshet chayil, this is, was a real eshet chayil, what she gave up for Rabbi Akiva, and he became who he became, you know in, he says in thanks to her, but uh, as soon as he got up and recovered from the great loss of his of his wife. He uh, suffered another tragic loss, which was the loss of his son, Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon went, and Rabbi Shimon also um, passed away. He became sick, and he passed away. And during this time, he had, um, you know, a lot of people came into the funeral, and they came in to, you know, console him. So Rabbi Kiva stood up, and he says, and he says, it cannot be that it's because of me 
that people are coming to console me because of my son's uh, funeral. Why? Because he says, even though everybody know, even though you want to say people know me, he was humble. He says, even though people over here know me, people out there don't know me. But let's say everybody knows me. He says, the woman and the children don't know me. Why did they come over here also? And he says, rather, he says, the reason why you've come to the funeral, why it was such a big turnout, was because of the honor of the Torah. And he says, I take comfort that my son, in his passing, Rabbi Akiva says, he went and he uh, brought more honor to the, to the Torah. And this is how, um, you know, Rabbi Akiva went. And Rabbi Akiva, not only was he able to, to uh, move on through life, through all the troubles of the entire, the entire uh, you know, Jewish nation, but also through his personal troubles as well. And the Bizat Hashem will continue next week with hopefully the, the final part of it. But again, the most important thing is it's not a story. This is his lessons. These are important, important life lessons that you can learn from it and that you should strive to, le to learn from it. And Bezalat Hashem, may we all be able to go and, and actually internalize these lessons and become even a smidget of something close to something close of close, if only to Rabbi Akiva, to his, uh, you know, to his thing. Obviously, we can't even imagine you know, coming even close to the fingernail or the dirt on the fingernail and that, but, but still, something to strive for. But I do want to say that if somebody wants more reading on this, sources, right? I know somebody asked me for sources, so if somebody wants... To do further reading on this, first of all, there is uh, plenty of Midrashim, and I can't start sitting here and, and sourcing you all the Midrashim. There's tons of Gemarot, and I'm skipping parts. I'm not even saying all the parts because it's, there's not enough time to go say the entire, his, or, or, you know, all the, all the, the, the things that he had in the Gemara. But um, there, are, there are a few other sources besides the Gemara, besides the Midrashim, besides, uh, you know, um, what is it? There was, there was uh, Officer Rabbi Nason, I think, also has. Uh, um, you know, things on him it does, but uh, there's also, there's a few English books that I would also recommend. However, I would have to be careful with which ones you, uh, you know, people, there's a lot of stuff that is not, they're not from Midrashim. And in fact, there are some books that are out there that it says you have to read in the beginning, because some of these books, they'll say in the beginning, so some of this is, is, is just extra fluff, you know, to make the story flow more. So you have to be careful what you read these things, but some good books in English, if anybody wants to read those, Rabbi Mayor Lehman, which was, uh, he was really, uh, Marcus Lehman is, is his English name, uh, in the 1800s, wrote it beautifully, uh, you know, the, the book uh, Akiva. There was also um, um, another English book that was written also by a rabbi, and the name is, and Rachel was his wife, which is also very interesting. It brings it from his wife's perspective as opposed to Rabbi Akiva's perspective. But again, you have to be careful because not everything here is Midrashim, it's some of the extra stuff. I would also, obviously, you know, when you're, when you're going through history, you always have to go quote Rabbi uh, Barrel Wine which is a very famous noted historian. There's also um, another, the, there's uh, somebody who came out, Rabbi Yaman Lau, came out with a series, The Sages, um, which is a little bit of a more of a difficult read, but still has a lot of, lot of information. There's a four volume ser um, series that he brings out that uh, on all the Tanaim and the Mu'alim, you know, about the, and it, it speaks a lot about them. So if whoever wants any more information on that, Either you can email me if you want direct, uh, the, you know, links of, the, of things. Uh, it was actually not links, like a link of, of where to buy the books. Uh, but these are all in English. The Gemara and the Midrashim are a little bit more difficult to find. But they're also, uh, they're also over there. And I would recommend, this story is so amazing. You can learn a lot by yourself. By all means, go buy out the books. Buy and, and learn from it. There's really so much chizuk that you can get from these things. Any questions? No questions. Chazak